I'll say okay. Then it'll disappear hopefully. Okay, and if you want this point, oh, yeah. 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 Okay, so uh, it's our great pleasure to have Professor Dipankar Moistro from Britain College in Massachusetts, USA, as our uh, colloquium speaker today. So Dipankar gave a talk in 2015, and I gave the introduction at the time, and he said that I said too much. So <laughs> I'll try to be brief now. But it's difficult to be brief because uh, we know Dipankarta for so long. And uh, at, I mean, we, we started talking to Dipankarta when we didn't know, uh, not to speak of astronomy, we didn't know how to email. So I think our one of our first emails yeah. was written to Dipankarta. I was going to tell you that D.Moistro, writing this email, um, time I started writing. <laughs> so, um, so Dipankar did his undergrad at the Erskine Presidency College and uh, went to Kanpur for master's and then to Yale for his PhD. At Yale, he worked with Charles Bailey and uh, later I will go to Yale and work with Charles Bailey. So that's a, that's a trend that you'll see will come back again and again in the introduction. So after his PhD uh, from Yale, he went to uh, Amsterdam to work with Sarah Markov and some of our students had later launched Amsterdam. And then after Amsterdam, he came back, he went back to the US and became a postdoc at University of Michigan and at uh, Ann Arbor uh, to work with uh, John Miller. And then uh, he even taught classes at Michigan. And after that, finally, he joined uh, Britain College in 20, 13. 13, 13. So the same year we joined here. Um, so, uh, so Dipankar does uh, preliminary, I mean, in, in, in his PhD, he worked on X-ray binaries. So he worked on multi-wavelength observation of X-ray binaries. And later on, he has also done, uh, as most X-ray binary people do, they have also, they realize that AGNs are much more interesting and has done some work on AGN as well. So they get uh, with their supermassive colleagues. That's right. Yeah. They, they, they try to collaborate with their supermassive colleagues. And um, and so he has done some of that. Um, and in general, Dipangarda is a is an experimentalist by sort oh, of uh, so yeah, <laughs> by heart. So he he has when he was at presidency, he tried to fix that two feet that three inch long tube telescope and he worked on that. In IIT Kanpur, his MSc project was essentially to fix a DR. So there's a low temperature, so he worked in a low temperature lab, but he didn't really do, I mean, at the end, probably he did some experiments, but initially his job was to actually uh, to fix the, fix some of the instruments. So so some, some instrumental, instrumentalist nature is there. And, uh, and uh, he's also a very avid uh, sort of uh, amateur astronomer and the stargazer in the sense that he uh, did astrophotography. He did a lot of, all, almost all the solar eclipses in our lifetime, I think people has covered. So he has both sides. Most most of us who became astronomers by reading Stephen Hawking's book, which I, I didn't really do that, but many people do that. Uh, they, they know about all these things, but they don't really go and observe that much. But Dipankarta did that. Um, and uh, so today also following that trend, he will uh, he will talk about uh, sort of uh, internationally published, uh, reputed work. Uh, I mean, starting with observations from a 12 inch telescope in his own campus. So it'll be very interesting to hear Dipankarta. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Ritavan. Uh, you managed to make me blush. In 2015, <laughs> you make me blush again. Uh, maybe that's the thing. But it's it's always an honor to come back and, and give a talk at presidency, where uh, you know, I'm more used to be on, on that side, you know, not, not on this side. So uh, it's uh, always a bit nervous. Um, so anyway, uh, and as Ritavan said, I'm, I'm going to talk about stuff that you can do with the telescope that you have Negative. a few doors down. 
Oh, is it next, next door? door? Next, next door. door. Next door. <laughs> yeah. So, so things that can be done, of course, you need a bit of luck and you need to be at the right place and like that. Um, now, before I get to this, um, you see like, you know, I, I put today's date, but then I wrote modified Julian date is this. So how many of you here are familiar with modi what is modified Julian date? Just raise your hand if you know what is modified Julian date. Why don't you know what modified Julian date is? All right, it's it's still less than 50% or so. Yeah, right? it's less than So again, I mean, nothing fancy. You can actually go up to Wikipedia and see no, if there is a modifier, that means there must be a Julian date. And that's that's probably more worth looking at what is Julian date, where it came from, what it means to be the solar cycle, lunar cycle. But that gets into a very, that's a talk in itself, and I'll skip that. Um, for our purposes, modified Julian date is just, I think, some of you can look up on the internet. It was like, I think. November 17th, 1858, some day, 100, 150 years ago. Uh, it's just continuous dates. Every day, it probably increases by one. So it's a day. Um, it's coordinated with time scales like UTC or so. Um, the reason we will use this instead of July 31 is, you know, July 31 and then it becomes August. It, Hard to keep track of, right? I mean, it, it, how many days has it has it has elapsed since I don't know April thirteenth? You can't say that very easily. But if I give the NJBs, you can just do the math. And say that. So most of the time, you will see like when I show these graphs, the x-axis. I mean, I do time series astronomy, so x-axis is mostly going to be time, and often that time will be in some form of NJB. Uh, although in some cases, if, if observation from one single night, I'll give the calendar date as well, just so you can think where you were on that day. Um, so um, what we are going to do, or uh, the hope is to probe extreme environments very close to black hole extra binaries. Now, that's a lot of jargon already thrown here. Some of you know, well, up to here, this is plain English. This is where, okay, black hole people know, or we think we know. Uh, this is where X-ray binaries. Um, again, I, I asked uh, Professor Ritavan and Professor Chitravan and others that you know, how many of you here are familiar with X-ray binaries? Uh, I mean, okay, some of you. I'll go through a quick recap for those of you who are not uh, into this. So what are X-ray binaries? Um, there are various kinds of X-ray yeah, binaries. Yeah. Oh, I, I turned off. No, no, it's like a oh, one to three to four kind of two. Okay, thank you. So as I said, there are various kinds of X-ray binaries. The ones that I'm going to focus on, uh, this is an artistic picture of one, how we think one of them might look like, how some probably would look like. Now, how did it get to this place? Well, um, the story started with a huge hydrogen gas cloud from which two stars were born together, gravitationally bound. Now, one was more massive than the other. So again, you know, from your stellar astrophysics classes, you know, or you will know that stars that are more massive go through their life cycle faster. So when you have a more massive star, it goes through its main sequence and later life stages faster, becomes a supernova, explodes, and after it explodes, our, the outer shells are all thrown away in space. What is left behind is, depending on the initial mass of the progenitor, uh, you are left with either a black hole or a neutron star. So now, we're still not at this picture. 
We started with this, and this one was more massive, exploded as a supernova. Now we are say, left with either a black hole or a neutron star. Still goes around like this. Now at some point, this other one you know, it goes through its main sequence lifetime, becomes red giant, super giant, whatever its mass be. It starts getting bigger. Now, as it gets bigger, these objects, they each have their gravitational sphere of influence. Kind of looks like two bigger lobes like this. Right? Anyone heard of Roche lobe? So that's, that's what I'm talking about. Two teardrops attached to each other. Essentially, I mean, the, the Roche lobe is otherwise an imaginary surface, but this star, as it sta starts becoming bigger and bigger, at some point, this one fills up its Roche lobe, and then material starts, so if you look at the potential well of such a Roche lobe system, you will see that, like, you know from, if there's a single object, the gravitational potential will just look like a nice plunge. When you have two of these, two wells, and then connected by a funnel, or a little uh, place where things can go, spill over. It's one of the Lagrangian points. So if you're doing uh, L1, L2, L3, the inner Lagrangian points. So material spills, from the, so here you have the black hole still, black hole or neutron star. This one has gotten bigger and filled its Roche lobe. Now we have Roche lobe overflow into the gravitational potential of the black hole or the neutron star. So that's what is happening here. This star has filled its Roche lobe. Here is the stream of material going through the inner Lagrange point. And then, because of conservation of angular momentum and energy dissipation, the material that spills in does not fall directly. System is going around, so it has angular momentum. It creates a disk, so the material spirals in, and eventually falls onto the <clears throat> compact object. That's my name for the black hole or neutron star. Um, and one of the properties of the disk is it gets heated. You have essentially a stream of particles, essentially hydrogen atoms, uh, coming and colliding, and they're in Keplerian orbits. When they're farther out, their velocities are less. The collisions are not that strong, so the disk temperature is low. As you get closer and closer, the temperature gets hotter and hotter. Uh, if you make some simplistic assumptions and do some calculations, uh, you can say, okay, it under so and so approximations. So and so reasonable approximations, you can say that the temperatures should increase as r to the minus three fourths. T goes with r to the minus three fourths, a very famous uh, result. Um, anyway, so I have some of the parts labeled here. This one is called the companion star or the donor star in the sense that it donates matter. And then there's the accretion stream getting into the accretion disk, falling into the compact object. And that's, that's where we would have stopped, but except that what we have learned is these objects seem to have quite often stuff going away at relativistic speeds. Uh, well, stuff or something. Some, it's not very clear always. There is only probably one or two where we definitely know that it's matter going out. In other cases, uh, the composition of this outflow is, is still a matter of research. But we still can see the light from these outflowing material, uh, outflowing stuff, which we call the jet. The quasar people do the same thing, call it different names, but that's, that's where we come together is basically it's the, once you get within a few short radius or short. If you, if you block the right hand side of this picture, then 
then you don't you don't know what it is. <laughs> so it's we're all talking at the same thing, you know. And that's all physics is about, right? Like with, uh, how we can unify things and not fight about differences. So that's that's how some of these would look like. Some have some extra binaries do have a different uh, accretion mode. I'm not going to talk about that afterwards. If we have time, we can discuss that. Um, oh, why are they called X-ray binaries? Uh, that's because again, I, as I was talking, that's why I talked about the temperature. That the temperature gets hotter and hotter and hotter. So for typical X-ray binaries are where you have you know, two stellar mass objects going around, the outer part of the disk is emitting in infrared or optical or so, and as you get closer, the disk is emitting in UV. And by the time you get very close to the um, compact object, it emits in X-rays. So that's where the X-ray binaries. So this. Now, hopefully, is this you would see this if you were very, very close to it. Realistically, the geometry of most of these things, like how big the scale is here, this is you know, like a very giant star, and this well, again not too far. You could put the whole thing if you got one such system and put it near the solar system. You can get it inside the orbit of Mercury or Venus. So this whole thing can fit. I mean, there are exceptions, but more or less, that's, that's the size scale we're talking about. So to see it this close, you have to be really close to, to be able to see all these systems. This doesn't really happen. Um, in reality, these things, even the closest of them are the ones that we have found are thousands of light years away within our own galaxy but thousands of light years away. So all this view, you're looking from far, 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 far away. And in fact, this does, this field does contain an X-ray binary. Uh, I could, that could be a trick question. Oh, can you point the X-ray binary? Can you point the X-ray binary? Anyone wants to take a guess? I, I'm following us. <laughs> Say again, this one? I don't know where I am. Okay, no, not this one. Huh? Where? It looks like a binary. No, if it looks like a binary, it is not. Uh, no, actually, yeah, it's, it's, it's this one. Yeah. It's so very close to the In fact, this is the system I'm going to talk about, and this was this image was taken during um, our observations. Oh. So this is an extra binary in outburst, but otherwise completely indistinguishable from other things. Yeah. Uh, this is optical image. Is they are mostly seeing the donut star. You are no, actually here you are seeing things. So that that's the part of the suspense. I'm not going. To, but if it were not in active stage, you would see the donut star. Although another complication with this particular one is actually there happens to be another. We call it interloper. You may remember from Smart Aquila X one and all these. There's oftentimes you know a three dimensional thing, and there's another star here, and the X-ray binary is here, and as seen from you, it looks very much like. Just the geometry thing. So do we have I mean if anything is deep in the very black object is there, you still have optical image, right? But for yes. the back uh, you can actually not right. Yeah, no, you don't in uh, optical, I think. Especially in optical, it's you are seeing as Rita said, the, the the so-called quiescent phases you're seeing at the donor stars light. Uh, even then, you, you can do interesting things to find out like periods and, and masses, or at least constraints on masses from that. Um, that's how, that's what my PhD uh, supervisor used to do. So X-ray binaries, so what do they do then? You know, they, as you saw, they're pretty unremarkable, right? 
Now, um, so what I'm going to do now is um, I'll play a movie from, this is an X-ray, what did I do? Uh, uh, leave, okay, so no, not leave. That's good. Stop chair, go to stop chair. Okay. Yeah. Minimize the thing. Yeah, minimize the thing and play the movie. Okay, this one. So there was, and there still are uh, these X-ray all sky monitors that that monitor the entire sky in X-rays, and you can create nice images of showing that show bright things. Now that image that I showed a few minutes ago. That was of a small part of the sky, only like 30 arc minutes by 30 arc minutes, okay? Now this movie will actually show the entire sky in small wider projection or so uh, for a few years. So by the way, uh, before I play this, so Suchitna, I don't know how much is of this gets recorded or not. All right. So this used to belong to uh, an instrument called Rossi X-ray Timing Explorer. It had an all-sky monitor. It worked beautifully till from mid nineties to 2010, 11 in the sky. But, and so you can see here at the bottom, these are the dates. Uh, Americans made the movie, so it's like the must day year format. There's not enough for that. So you can see unlike Tons and tons of stars in optical image. Here you see only two blinking lights. Uh, you see something that is moving. Yeah. That's actually the sun. Yeah. Um, by the way, the coordinate system in this map is actually the galactic coordinate. So this is the galactic equator. Most stars in our galaxy are on this plane, and you can you can basically say from that this map. That most of these objects that are going on, these are galactic in nature. Right? Um, the color is indicative of the ratio of um, hard X ray energies to soft X ray energies. So when a source have, is emitting lots of soft X rays, which is low energy X rays, shows up as reddish. And then as it relatively emits more and more harder or higher energy X-rays compared to softer energy X-rays, this red to green to blue, that's the progression. So curious to know, size is proportional to the overall size. luminosity. luminosity. So, uh, so there are a few which are persistently bright. Mm -hmm. Perhaps this one. Still, there's some flickering, but not a lot. Um, but there are a lot that come and go. And by the way, these are mostly X-ray binaries in our galaxy. I mean, if you're very careful, uh, you might spot one or two extragalactic objects, but I mean, this, this all-sky camera is not sensitive enough to pick up extragalactic AGM or what about the pulsars? They don't show up. Not, not at this level. Some of them are, I mean, I think Vela, Vela pulsar. Vela, you mean the yeah. one? They probably, I don't know off the top of my uh, But a lot of them come and go. Some are persistent. Mm -hmm. So that's more or less the, the message I want you to take from here is, if you had X-ray eyes and looked at the sky, you would see you know, some of these persistently bright X-ray binaries, some come and go, okay? Now, even though this movie is only like one year, but you can do that and you know, perhaps folks who are doing surveys, I don't know if Rosita is making a movie like that or uh, Maxi. I have, I have a new equation. You have something like that? Part me has a movie now about, about this. But for me, is at the higher energy. Yeah. So, okay. So, anyway, I will try to see if I can get back to my. This is the PowerPoint. Yeah, maximize the. Yeah, now share. 
and there. Yeah, I think I minimized not PowerPoint, but here. Okay. Okay. I think I am back. So you saw very roughly what X ray buying used to be. They do a lot more. Tons and tons of paper have been written about them. Um, here is what we would call a light curve. What is a light curve? It's just x axis is time, y axis is brightness, x ray brightness, x ray intensity in some units. Well, in this case, the unit x ray astronomers, when they first, you know, some of the first x ray missions went up, they saw the trap nebula, the trap pulsar, and that was defined as the standard candle. So all other brightnesses were measured with respect to trap. So this is in units of trap. Uh, this particular one was 4 to 16, 30 minus 47. This refers to the right attention declination, which means it's the fourth Julie catalog. Julie was one of the earlier missions. Um, this, this light curve was created using the RXP ASM, the movie that I showed you guys. Mm -hmm. um, so you can see this is a many year long light curve and it does something for a few months and then nothing, 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 and then something again, nothing, very erratic. Right? Um, these are what we call transient X-ray binaries. We don't know when these will go off and when they will go down, this is what we call quiescence. And when they do things, we call it an outburst, epochs of activity versus inactivity. We still don't know what triggers these things, especially what triggers outbursts. So as you can see, I mean, you know, most of the time is spent in this quiescence stage, not doing anything, okay? Um, Occasional outbursts when the source becomes bright. In fact, the ASM is not sensitive. This is consistent with zero. You can detect them in quiescence using other more deeper X-ray, bigger X-ray telescopes, and you can get the brightness in quiescence. And you can see that in quiescence, they become like a million times brighter than in uh, sorry, in outburst peaks can be a million times brighter than quiescence. Uh, but that said, I mean, different outbursts are not of the same intensity, right? Some, some are weak, some are quite bright, some are strong. I wish I could say why that is. That was supposed to be my PhD thesis, mm -hmm. and we still are, you know, debating. Again, as you can see from the scale of the graph, a single outburst can last anywhere from a few weeks to a few months or so. But once it goes up, okay, so it does its thing for a while, a few weeks, and then goes down. So that's what more or less I would say, still say that if you can take anything as typical behavior, is that quiescence, outburst, while in outburst, it's bright for a while, and then it goes up. Okay. Um, when I was actually a grad student, one of my things used to be uh, my PhD supervisor, he actually had an optical telescope in Chile uh, and images would come from that. And I would go in the morning and, and get the image and now seems almost ridiculous, but I would reduce the image by hand, get even the optical brightness, put it on a graph and then see if it went and did something. Outburst. We actually had a program to, like, we were sometimes like this a ASM was so insensitive that sometimes you could see the optical rising before the ASM saw anything. And if that happened, so that was our niche, our proposal is we would then call, you know, whatever Chandra X ray telescope or some other authorities and say, this object is going into outburst. We have detected it first, so can we please observe it? That was. So that, those are the ATLs, right? Those are the ATLs. <laughs> but 
they always have the habit of going off on Friday afternoons or something. You know? I don't know how they knew that, but or if I had to, you know. <laughs> I mean, you know, there's there's not much of an average. You can do as much Fourier analysis or whatever you want to do. It's uh, finding the recurrence time has still been a uh, thing. I mean, in this case, maybe it looks like I don't know. Maybe this, this, this. So in that case, you know, maybe five hundred ish days for for the sixteen thirty, but. People have tried to predict that and failed miserably many, many times. So it hasn't. But science wise, there's things you can do. I mean, especially with these transient sources whose brightness goes up and down by a lot. Because, you know, when the brightness is going up and down by a million times, that means things are happening in the accretion disk very differently. The state of the accretion disk, the temperature density, the nature of the accretion flow, the material that's coming in, all that is very different in the quiescent state as opposed to when it's in the output. And in fact, when you use more pointed telescopes, Chandra, or even this RXTV had other instruments that could take detailed measurements of each source, you could see there spectral shape change as they evolve. And from there, you can then start doing the physics and, and start talking about what is causing, I mean, these are instabilities, right? I mean, things are not stable. So what are causing these instabilities? Once it's here, what tells it to stop? Or once it's here, what tells it to go on? Or even the state of the disk itself. You can find a lot, but so far, you know, it's the understanding of that. We have advanced quite a bit, but there's still a lot to learn about how the disks work, especially when you get close, very close to the black compact object where effects of general relativity become strong as well. Uh, sometimes, yes, uh, based on, and this goes to quiescence. If you, if you look at the quiescent optical light curve, you are looking at this teardrop-shaped secondary star that is doing like this. If that, so the modulation in that case, the light that you will see depends on the orientation. But that's the orientation of the object. The orient not be that big. Um, no, no, I just say, okay, she was there. Yeah, it will be the same thing. You would have to the angular moment coming back. Exactly. Okay. Uh, I mean, there have been things people say, like, okay, once it gets very close to the black hole, if the black hole is spinning differently, then lengthening yeah. precision and things like that. But at but least on the outer accretion disk, it is supposed to be not too far in different from the outer. So, I mean, typically people give the outline in the beginning, but you know, my apologies for the beginning and putting this in the middle, but I have already covered hopefully these two, uh, you know, what are X-ray binaries, why talk about them. Uh, now I'm going to you know, really focus into our object. This, my system, it's in the constellation of Cygnus. Uh, it's one of the nice summer constellations if you can, put a little bit of imagination. This is one of those constellations where you don't need much imagination, but you can really imagine a swan flying. And so that's the Cygnus. And the variable star number 404 in Cygnus. So it went into an outburst, as I'm saying, here in 2015, June and July. I'll talk about our observations and what we learned or what, what we didn't learn from that. So what are the properties that we know of this system V404 Cygni or V404 Cygni. Um, it, it went in outburst in, in, in like 90s and so on. Um, and from since then, from, from its outburst in 90s, it had been in quiescence. And the quiescence measurements, optical observations or other observations, tell you things like 
uh, you can constrain the mass of the compact object, which we think is in the range of 10 to 15 solar masses. And if it's 10 to 15 solar masses, we don't think it's a neutron star. Most neutron stars we think can't be more than at least 15 solar mass or so. And uh, the donor is anywhere between half to 20 solar mass. Um, actually using radio observations, very high resolution radio observations, uh, my friend James Miller Jones was actually able to see that the radio source wobbled like this in the sky. It was essentially motion of the star against its center of mass. Wherever the radio pole is, it's not at the center of mass, the gravitational center of mass. So that wobbling tells you how much how much from away from the center of mass the, the radio source is. And from that, and because you can see how much it's wobbling in the sky, you can use parallax high school uh, math and figure out how far away it is. Uh, so that we have a fairly good handle on the distance to this system. Uh, in light years, it's about 8,000 plus or minus 450 or so light years away. That's how far it is. Um, the orbital period is close to a week, six and a half days. Um, there were previous outbursts in Sorry, not in 1989, um, but also people went and looked at archival data and found that it actually had outbursts in 1956 and 38 as well. So these were outbursts in the hospital. hospital. Yeah. Well, 89, we had X-rays by then. Yeah. 56, you were X-ray. Yeah. But there were, you know, at that time, people were making surveys of the sky and you know, the Harvard place typically have so from there, uh, we have some idea of how things change, although it's nowhere, the coverage is not as good. Anyway, so that's roughly speaking our system. Um, so other than those outbursts, I'm, my main focus is, is the 2015 outburst. Now, what threw us off completely was that now, nothing about this 2015 outburst was usual. And by usual, I'll, so here's a zoom of a usual outburst of a usual X-ray binary. It's like, you know, I was showing that other graph a few slides ago, and I've almost zoomed into one of those. It's a different source. But again, it, it, here the brightness is very low, fast rise, exponential decay. We call them shreds, fast rise exponential decay like those. This is what most people would call it. Typical, usual outburst, lasting, in this case, you know, about 150 milliliters. Goes bright, stays bright, decays, goes away. But for V404, this is the very soft X-ray light curve. 3 to 13 kilo electron volts. Are people aware of kilo electron volts as a unit of energy? Could be. Could be. Okay. In electron volts, people are in the classroom. Yeah, in these 1,000 electron volts, our optical light has energy of about you know, thousands of an electron volt. Well, or one electron. <laughs> Yeah, an electron volt. Yeah. Electron volt. How yeah. does the one change? Yeah. Other other <laughs> exactly. Um, yeah, thirteen point six <laughs> electron volt is the hand. Yeah. Um, so anyway, so this is three to thirteen kilo electron volt. Again, um, this is where X-ray astronomers fight. Some people will say this is hard. Some people will say this is soft. I'm going to say this is soft, as in low energy, for reasons that will become clear. Anyway, what I want to focus here is see this much is one day. Okay, just I put the scale here. So you see nothing, 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 and then a blip, a, and then goes back. Nothing, nothing again for a few minutes or maybe an hour, and then again goes up, comes down. Minute Sharp. Changes. Huh? Minute scale changes. Minute scale changes. Yeah. Okay. Now. 
soft X-rays, low energy X-rays are coming from, you know, if you think of accretion disk, the lowest energies are coming from outside, it's going to go closer. What happens if we go to higher energies? So here is a little higher, 13 to 30, still looks very similar, not much same. And this is covered in this solution? This is integral. This is integral. Yeah. Go a little bit higher energies. What are we talking? 20 to 40 kilo electron volts. See, I, I, from my X-ray binary perspective, for me, soft X-rays is up to like seven, eight kilo electron volts. And then medium energies, I would call 10, 15. And then 20 kV onwards, I call hard. Okay, then others will have different definitions. But for me also, this is getting hard X-rays. Typically, X-ray binaries, you know, you'll have little emission at that energies once they are in outburst. Now we're at 40 to 80 kilo electron volts, still going strong. Of course, the amplitude of the flare is decreasing. Yeah, relatively. There is a spectrum. So, to, yeah. And why was the integral observing it? Oh, everyone in the world was observing. Oh, because it went into yeah. yeah. So okay, but they were observing from even before the there. Yeah, I guess there maybe there was a blip even before that. Yeah, no, the, this is let's see. This is June 21 is 94. I think middle of June was when some of these first blips yeah. started happening and people people got affected. Um Even higher, 150 to 300 kV. Similar things going on. Uh, again, yeah, amplitude is decreasing. You have few photons, but they're doing the same. In fact, now if I turn this into a spectrum, um, here is from the smallest spectrum. Uh, some people claim they actually even wrote a, a major paper on this. Um, which again, major papers have a tendency uh, to be wrong. <laughs> yeah, but but you can you know maybe there is something here in excess. And this ex what got them excited was that okay you know you you model this with the power law there is a little bit of excess, but this excess is in the regime of the five hundred and those of you who know, you know electrons. 511 kV is the electron volume. So they were like, okay, I guess I wrote it up here. So yeah, it's cool. It got people really excited. And, and again, in X-ray binaries, you don't see this happening at that, that very high. Uh, the yeah, uh, I'll, have to go, I'll have to go and look up the actual okay. papers, but I have my feeling here is this is the unabsorbed, this may be unabsorbed. unabsorbed, could be, but I don't know if I can explain that part here. Yeah. Okay, anyway, good point, yeah. Unfortunately, our local resident Seaford Galaxy accretion this expert is not present today. <laughs> Tell him that he's going to fail in his PhD. <laughs> the first time someone came to be <laughs> absent in the colloquium. Oh. Um, but, you know, this, it's exciting stuff happening here. We don't know. So we got to... Similarly, I'm not showing the, all the optical light curves, but the optical was doing similar odd things as well. And at that time, I had... An undergraduate student, he was a second year undergraduate, he was doing a completely different project. Uh, but we had recently acquired, just like you have recently acquired the 12 inch, we had at that point uh, being fed up with our previous telescope, we had a, a new uh, 12 inch telescope which was sitting on our campus observatory roof. So, we, and, and it happened to be, you know, this June and Cygnus, this happened in June, and in the month of June, Cygnus is perfect for observing. It, it rises early in the evening. You can see it almost throughout the night. And, and this also happened to be right around the time when there was not much 
moon. A lot of things align. <laughs> so you have to be, there, some, there has to be a little bit of luck. Um, so, so good student, uh, telescope. Telescopes are okay, telescopes people have. But we had clear skies and uh, not much moon, and the target happened to go, you know, it was, we could follow it for a good chunk of the night. Uh, now, not many people know where Wheaton is, so I thought I'd just show a map here. Uh, in the US, New York, Boston, and uh, okay, so if you do New York, Boston, we're just, just a little bit away from Boston. We're essentially in the suburbs of Boston. Um, this part is extremely light for you. It's Okay, probably not as bad as here. I don't know the limiting magnitude here. You can probably see the moon, but I don't know. Um, but we can, I mean, things have gotten worse. I mean, when I joined 10 years ago on clear, uh, clear new moon nights, we could barely get see the Milky Way, not at all. <laughs> so we thought we thought. Um, anyway, so that's, that's where we are. And um, here's actually on <laughs> during one of those evenings, um, the, this is the student John Scarpacci. He is uh, that that's the telescope there that we used uh, on the, this pier on the roof because we were still testing it. Later on, we moved it on a, on a dome. Uh, the 12 inch new telescope is a CCD down there. And um, the camera is being controlled by the laptop here, and we put a, a cardboard box so that the glare will not disturb. Uh, so there's John with his data acquisition, and here I'm, I have, well, this I have something else, but basically I was finder charts and other things. So I was, so I'll be your assistant. <laughs> so we had a 12 inch Mead Schmidt Cassegrain reflector equipped with a as big uh, 8300M CCD camera, thermoelectrically cooled to minus 20 Celsius to keep you know, a little bit of noise down. Um, we had basic Johnson Cousins filters, which, um, so, so these are the, you know, filters that, that we had on our telescope. These are wavelengths, 4,000, 6,000, 8,000 angstroms. And this is the U-band filter. You're basically looking at the, how much transmission uh, these filters have. Uh, so what we did was we had, essentially instead of U and V, we decided to stick with V, R, and I-band filters. Uh, actually, the first night, we weren't sure what we would get. So we actually just use the V-band filter. So this is our result, photometric result from first night. Very simple. We just sat at the telescope, made sure we had the right focus, we got the star, and we didn't have any automation. John was sitting and like, okay, take an image. <laughs> as soon as the, the image was taken, it was saved in the hard drive, take the next image. As manual as things can be. We took about 450 or so data points that night, uh, four and a half hours of observing time that we had. Um, How much did you put on the evaluation from one of these? Yeah. So these were, um, I believe, 30 second exposures. Yeah, this is 4,000 million. Monkey order of the That's ridiculously bright. That's very like 11 magnitude or something. Yes, it was. It was. In fact, we, I had another telescope and I was just looking at it visually. Uh -huh. and there were times in front of my eyes I could see it. Yeah, yeah, it go up and down in brightness. Um, if you are very careful, you will see that some places are not too easy to see, but especially near the end, so there are some there are some little data gaps. Those data gaps were when you know, June, July um, over there uh, where we are is not too unlike here in terms of humidity. 
And the schmidt cassegrain telescope, you have the, the many scope, the, there's a lens on the top. And that was, condensation was happening on it like anything. So I, and I knew this would happen. So I actually had a hair dryer. <laughs> we had a uh, basic hair dryer and I would go every few minutes and I would dry the telescope's uh, top lens off. Otherwise, there would be a pool of water in there. So maybe the next time we buy a hairdryer from our departmental contingent. <laughs> now, you guys made a better decision of getting a long tube <laughs> because you see, you always fall straight. If you have a long tube, you won't cover up the mirror as easily as a Schmidt Cassidy. I mean, since then, we have put like a cover uh, on top to extend it, but still, I mean, June, July, August is nightmare in, in those terms of getting data. It's too much humidity. So, what would be the collision state where stuff of the equation? Way down. I'll, I'll show you something where it gets what massive. Is the time it will down or four time or the four or the three? So this is, uh, I can give you the numbers in, in magnet, astronomical magnitude. As Rikama was saying, this this was fluctuating 11, 12. This at quiescence, we are talking about 18. Okay. So 18 and 2 to the power 7 okay. times, so 2.5 to the power 7 okay. times, you want 5 is 100. So it's like hundred thousand, roughly thousand times or even ten thousand. Um, all right. So, so as you as we already were talking about, right? I mean, I think the biggest thing that you see here is the variability. Is like here you can see a factor of nine or ten variation in times as small as 15 minutes. Yeah, you don't see this very often. Something's going on, very puzzling. So the next night was cloudy, so we couldn't do anything, but we, the two nights later, it became clear again. Now this time, we got um, more courageous. Remember last, that previous night was only V-band visual greenish light. This time, again, nothing, uh, we didn't have any software or so to automate thing. I just told John, full cycle, VRI, VRI, VRI. There were some mistakes, but they did it mostly correctly. So V image, R image, I image. Again, we started in the beginning. It was doing its things and there were times, actually even here, I. I well, this one, I was not looking to the other telescope. I was looking at the images that were coming down. As this started going down, you know, I was getting worried that you're going to lose it. I went and looked if the telescope got covered with dew or not. No, it was okay. It really was fading. It was fading so much. So, you know, the initial exposures were like 30 seconds or so. I kept increasing, increasing. And some of these images are even like two, four, five minute exposures. But we managed to follow it as, as much as, as we could. Uh, and that later on when we were working with this data, we found out um, to a colleague, which was a Greenberg, she said, oh, integral was observing at that time and I got the integral light curve. Would you like to do something? Said, yes, please. Uh, put, you know, we'll, we'll do something together. So Victoria gave us the um, integral light curve, and there you go. This is the 20 to 40 kV light curve. That's the black one. Right? That's the black one, yeah. I'll, I'll link it one more time. <laughs> Very well correlated. In fact, we did some sophisticated you know, cross-correlation analysis and stuff, and we didn't find any delays or lags or delays between. The, yeah. <laughs> or even the optical optical. Yeah. Uh, what you could do is, I mean, we did autocorrelation functions as well, and you could see that the X-ray autocorrelation point was, was narrower than the optical, which tells you that the optical was from a slightly larger. Any quantum harmonic quantum photo? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, the in the integral data was, I mean, 
as you will see later, I mean, it, even the optical had enough things that I thought, let's keep the integral for integral folks to do their full X-ray analysis, which they didn't produce and so on. Uh, but but the optical said some things as well, and I wanted to focus on that. So now that we saw the light curves, we thought that okay, so okay, in, in optical we only have three bands, right? Which is V, R, and I. Still, please uh, not, not stretch. Uh, okay, you can plot them. Here's the frequency. Okay, astronomers like to take the log of everything. So log of frequency. <laughs> versus the log of the flux density, okay? So I, essentially I, I choose a small interval of time, find the nearest ones, and I say, let's assume they're simultaneous. That's the best I can do. I take the closest ones, okay? And so V, R, and I points, I put them here. Now from here, we can start to do some Astrophysics. So far, it has been mostly astronomy. What does it tell us from there? Oh, by the way, one other thing before doing, showing you these graphs, there was some other things that had to be done to obtain these numbers. Um, firstly, uh, there was an interloper. There was another star in the line along the line of sight which is completely unrelated to the visible pole, which was contributing a constant amount of light, which we knew from previous observations how much the other one contributed. So we subtracted that part. Also, one other thing we did was given we know the distance and position, we know how much the light is extincted because of interstellar dust. So we used standard prescriptions to take care of the, what we call D redding. So we, we we assume that we, we took care of the extinction and reddening due as the light came to the interstellar. So after all of that, we have this, let's say. So we have you know, spectra like this all through. What happens there? So the optical is that we saw in the beginning? Yeah. Or what is from this instance? No, that was a from That was a V-band image from one of those nights. Now I can't say at all like which one it was. No, no, no. I'm asking because I was thinking of when you go for the better magnitude, one you need some some satellite stars. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that was all done. You know, there are B404 is bright enough that the AABS or American Association of Variable Star Observers, you have four or five comparison stars in the field of view that we used to determine. So this was all done uh, in aperture for that. So, okay, so we have, let's say, these fluxes at different frequencies. For reasons that I will not tell you now, and I'll only tell you if you ask me afterwards, because I tend to take too much time. <laughs> I'm going to skip the middle point. V, R, I. I'm not going to talk about the I. Uh, sorry, I'm not going to talk about the R. So here's your know, frequency-wise. This is V, and this is I. Okay. We have two points. Simplest thing would be to join the <laughs> line. Of course, this is the log log plot. So what you have is basically the slope of a power plot. Okay. So we are assuming that the flux goes as if the flux is f nu, we can assume that f nu goes as mu to the power alpha, alpha is my power law index. So what's the power law in this? I can find for each of these objects. So that's what I have shown in this graph. So here is our main data. From there, this is the slope of this power law. Mm -hmm. uh, and you can see the numbers, there's some fluctuation, but again, if you look at the error bars, it's more or less consistent with constant, right? Or so, really yeah, and it's very close to zero. So, I in fact, I mean, so the mean is about 0. 0.2 with an uh, error of plus minus 0. 0.1 based on Markov chain Monte Carlo, whatever it's, it's simple, you can see. 
Uh, okay. So even though the flux changes by this to this factor of 20, 25 times flux change, the source slope of the power law does not change. So this becomes our question now, astrophysics question. What process or processes in an X-ray binary can produce and maintain this constant slope of about 0 0.2 or so, even though both the optical and even the integral flux changes by huge amounts, 25 times, the optical changes by 25 times. How can you maintain that? So we explored some scenarios. You look at, that's when you see something, okay, you go back to literature and see, oh, so-and-so, Sakura Sunyai, this, what do you expect? This, what do you expect? Uh, what did the expert people find about their social media? <laughs> you cannot <laughs> inform them that you can you will not be told. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and I mean that that would be much higher than this. No, no, of course. Yeah, I don't I don't know of the of the mind. Yes, it's the expert index in there, the extra there are like a lot of observations. Yeah, that integral of integral. There were like many bands. Yeah. So the same thing could have been seen in integral. That if the power law slope stays flat, or does it change? Yeah. Well, but the thing with even with integral, you saw that the count rate drops to next to nothing. So you can't, so it won't be able to. You won't have enough signal to noise. In so not time. a signal. Not a big time. It seems if you have a longer time. Yeah. You can. You can. Yeah. A reliable signal. Yeah. Yeah, but definitely not on the optical time scale. Yeah. The also these not like your typical pair of steep rising and no, that, yeah, that's why I was saying it was unusual, right? I mean, those X-ray binaries stay bright for weeks to months, yeah. and here it's few hours or minutes, and then it's gone. <laughs> so let's see what the optical says. The X ray and radio people are doing their thing. <laughs> but I can't I can't take everyone's data and write my paper, right? So I have to be political here. That's the multi wavelength. So here now I'm I'm trying to uh, see what physical scenarios could produce this. So that standard accretion disk that I showed you, that T goes as R to the minus three quarters, you know, of course, the so called Sakura and Sunyai. Uh, for a disk that has this kind of temperature profile, you can actually show that um, the, the frequency dependence of the flux density goes as mu to the power one third. Now, one third means 0 0.33, whatever. And, and that 0 0.3 is actually within yeah. what I wrote here, right? So it could be the thing, except if it was really the Sakura Sunyaya disk changing, you, you know the size of the system. And for such a big system, you know, you're still talking about something about the size of a bit of mercury or something. Viscous time scales in those would be order of days or weeks. So you cannot really make a super circular signal this very that much in with remember you have to keep the slope like, the fix, the like this and it goes up and down. But also, I mean you cannot make a disk hotter, brighter without making it hotter. So it has well, to be a bluer and brighter kind of thing. You are when brighter, but it, if you are in the reality, what you fail, then maybe not. Exactly. I mean, in the, uh, I don't have a board here. What is the use? The great thing about here, the I love it. But, uh, <laughs> Thank you. So, Sakura Sunyaev disk is, think of each of these links as a black body. So, this is. New. And this is uh, new. This one will be equal to that. Again, this this is long. We are astronomers. Okay. 
There's the rally gym still. This is the um, green, green chair. This one. So when you add all of these up, this is your overall spectrum. And typically your V and the I bands, I'm talking about the V and the I band slopes. The V band would be like here and the I band would be here. So even like you're saying, brighter but bluer, but this part stays flat. But in order for this up and down to happen, it would it would need to happen on viscous time scales, which are much longer. Yes, absolutely. Another thing that we see in X-ray binaries is um, the outer accretion disk can intercept some of the X-ray flux coming from the inside, and the outer part can get even hotter. So it's if you think of the geometry, here's your macular neutron star, the disk, if it's flared up like this, then the inner X-rays can go and hit the outer disk. They become re they reprocess and then they result emitted in optical. So your disk spectrum, now remember earlier, our just the simple circular sinai disk, this would be the Lalevin scale, this would be the nearest flat mu to the one third, and this is the soft x ray n. What this does is it creates a bump that you guys will see. But that bump will not have this kind of a slope and the variability. And in order to keep it constant, this remember this is also varying by factor of 25 or so. And the factor of 25 variation in luminosity, you do Stefan Boltzmann law, luminosity goes to sigma t to the four. It's it's a significant change in temperature as well. And a significant change in temperature will, will shift this peak here and you would see the slope fluctuation. So thanks to your excellent projection system, we can say this is ruled out as well. Okay. All right. Okay. Enough scenarios. Let me go to James because you're the one in Sujitana likes James. Okay. Not Sujitana. Okay. So, how can you, can a jet make something like this? So, how would we do, how would we create such a spectrum from a jet? One of the easiest things to do, and therefore it has been done is you sort of break this jet into small segments. In each segment, you assume there is energetic, let's assume, okay, you have to assume it's made of something. Now, most likely it's not heavy protons or so because then kinetic energy budget issues become very high. So let's assume an electron positron jet. So there's electrons here. So you have, you choose your favorite distribution of electrons, like what's the energy distribution of the electrons, so Maxwellian power law, of course, Schock's power law. You can play with that. And you assume there's some magnetic field. So you have magnetic field, electrons, what kind of radiation would be produced? Synchrotron. So how would such a synchrotron spectrum look like? So let's say here's my first most energetic section here. That produces classic shape like this. This side is called the optically thin, this is called the optically thick. But that's just the this section. You go farther out. That one produces this. It's a little less energetic over here. The electrons are a little less energetic. Maybe the magnetic field decreases in some way. So the peak shifts a little bit. You can actually make them, I mean, typically when we talk of synchrotron, you do radio, but here if you 
take you know energy electron densities of something like you know 10 to the 3 electrons per cubic centimeter so it's the gamma square b of the electron so the gamma is the gammas are like 10 let's say and magnetic field is two gauss so it's a 10 to the 6 gamma square b so it comes to infrared or optical in fact um sorry i lost my train uh, b we can for x-ray binaries we can Oh, we do higher 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 higher. Higher. the B can be thousand yeah. gamma square. Yeah. Okay. So that, that does push you the, the synchrotron. Yeah, yeah. 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 the magnetic field is, is it's quite it's quite very big. close to a stellar mass black hole. Oh. So okay. it's compact. Oh. So I mean galactic center also at, at model with much lower like few gauss because remember neutron star surface that has magnetic fields of 10 to over 8 gauss yeah. or 12 gauss okay so looks like we agree so we can go farther and farther and farther keep shifting but this is one of the things that you know uh, blanford and Conway showed in like 79 you know, that if you if you assume a reasonable conical jet with you know, magnetic field going down as like one over r or so, you can show that this comes out as nearly flat. And you need to do you can change it a little bit again with especially with tuning the gamma, how fast things are moving, or with the inclination of your jet. But generically, you would get a rather flat spectrum all the way from your optically thin onwards. So your overall spectrum looks like. So that's the flat spectrum of the flat spectrum radio mm -hmm. yes. that's 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 right. Right. But uh, in the jet in total, you have new moments in this jet direction. I'm sorry, I'm not. The, the jet is not beamed, that's what he's saying. Is it yeah. beamed in this case or not? Um, I mean, the gamma is not super. We, we assume ten. gammas of, of the order, no, not even 10. Like not even 10, three, huge. 3, 4. The gamma square is 10. No, but, uh, there no, are but, two factors. So this is electron gamma you're talking about? Or no, 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 no. He's talking about bulk flow. Oh, but, uh, no, I was talking about bulk, bulk speed. Bulk speed. Yeah, yeah, bulk speed. No, but what is the direction of this jet? Is it towards the observer? Is it? Not? So we are not resolving it. Yeah. So, so if it is not can I see it? That's my question. Yeah. So it is. It has to be. It cannot be per perpendicular. Well, I mean, if you're thinking of like Doppler D two B beaming, this the gamma is the bulk gamma is not that high to to see it one way or the other. In fact, uh, radio astronomers frequently see um, blobs coming out of these kind of systems in both yeah. directions. Yeah. And we do see, I mean, and when in those cases, when we see that coming, then you can measure the intensities of the blobs on two sides and get a good yeah. handle on the, on the ground. Yeah. yeah. So, okay, so this model does produce a flat spectrum. Um, slightly inverted, but in the it's exactly about like where you know point two point one where our numbers came out to be. Um, just to put things very roughly speaking, so our observed power law index point two is in, in the jet interpretation of things. We would then say that. Our V and I bands are somewhere here in the optically thick part of the jet. And because the jet is coming or is being emitted from a very, very small region compared to the accretion disk, only a small change in the jet, let's say, you know, however the jet is powered. You're feeding something to the jet. And even if you change that by a small amount, you can change the jet's overall luminosity by changing the feeding of the jet. What that will do is, if, if you think of this, this line here, it will do essentially in the model perspective, it will like this, 
You give it more mass, it will do like that, give it even more, it becomes like this. But your VLI bands are over here. So you can keeping the keeping the spectrum index flat, you can make the overall luminosity change quite quite fast here, quite easily in the jet scenario. Can the spectral spectrum be able to actually clean these things? They get spectral indices that are consistent with that. Um, but in X-rays, there's also complications that comes in, for instance, you know. People are never sure whether, because you can see the, uh, the X-ray spectrum often can be modeled. It's rarely a very nice single power law algorithm. If there is a little bit of curvature here and there, people will say, especially there are groups uh, without naming, you know, I'll say there are groups who will say, this is inverse Compton. This is but the X-rays are very well correlated to the optical, okay. which means that those are also from, from primarily the, from the jet. Yeah. But okay. they could still be in this scenario. Those are very correlated. Yeah. Okay. But like synchrotron self counter would do like for this, you would this would be the synchrotron, and then the corresponding synchrotron self counter would be like that. There will be delay, basically little bit of delay. Yeah, I don't know if we can uh, detect that. Yeah, yeah. how would you do it? It's uh, that basically can you know, depend on the size. The size yeah, uh, but here we are talking about sizes that are realistically probably only a few kilometers in size. So. Kilometers, of course, we can. Yeah, so this that will be like micro. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, but there are indications. I mean, in, in ADN and in X ray binaries, we, you can do things like. Like jet or whatever is being produced here, you have hard x rays, right? People have seen this. This is, I'm going slightly off topic here, but uh, these hard x rays hit the inner accretion disk right. and then they fluoresce the iron here. Yeah. And then you can see the iron, and people have actually seen the delay, little bit of delay, which is commensurate with the light travel time. What if it is thoroughly mixed with this? That is exactly what it does. Yeah. So, uh, this is my last slide. Uh, so I'm worried that this is going to be a different discussion. Yeah. <laughs> you should see the title yeah, yeah, yeah. and send to them. <laughs> no, probably it took a uh, binary as a more than the binary part. <laughs> it's uh, hard to guess what it is. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, this is what I was talking about, right? Like as long as the optically thin to thin break, mm -hmm. so this, here's the break between here's your optically thin, here's the optically thin. This is the so-called jet break. So as long as this break is bluer than the V band, yeah. the jet jet scenario explains you know, what has been going on here. So that's the question with the normal mass. Yeah. Right. Again, modulo electron distribution and magnetic field. Yeah. So I I I did not go that far. Um, so if, um, but still, like sort of continuing on, on what you were saying, that if the break frequency is indeed higher than the V band, uh, and I'm saying this as if you know this is unusual, and that is unusual because at least in some of the cases in X-ray binaries where a jet break has been detected, those jet breaks have typically been in the infrared. So much, much like over here, I'd say jet breaks. Dave Russell has done quite a lot of work on that, and those detections seem to be good. So in that sense, this is. Very and it's very compact jet breaks. Can you like, talk? yeah, sure. No, please. It's one of the natural uh, natural killer was natural binary. It's not the most. I since you asked it, I will remind me in a second after I'm done. I do have like a census made by you know Jerry's always with some of the sizes of it. Uh, but it, it is on the massive side, but it's not the most. It's you know 10 to 15 is, is pretty fast. A lot of them. 
So if the if indeed so so far if you are with my story and if we now continue with that story that the jet break is at a higher frequency that would really require a very compact very energetic jet breaks. If the jet break is indeed very compact, lots of energy packed into a very small region, then it becomes easier. Essentially, the optical depth to pair annihilation becomes feasible at that point. You get to close to unity optical depth of uh, pair, pair reduction. And that would then, that would say if that, may I show that spectrum with a little bump to it, yeah. uh, it could possibly. While I do not have optical polarization experiments or, or results, the people who made optical polarization observations, they reported rather low optical polarization, which again is what you would expect. If you have synchrotron, again, this goes back to uh, Goldstein and other you know, textbooks. In this synchrotron spectrum, this optically Inside, if you have ordered magnetic field, you can get up to 70% polarization, but not on the optically thick side because that's multiple scattering. So, so this is all optically thick, and you do expect polarization to be low on this side. I'm speculating on this side, so don't, don't go too far. However, this was actually observed. Um, James Miller Jones, who was using some of the radio telescope arrays in his disposal, at his disposal, um, later on showed that around this time, it's not exactly at the same time, but within those two weeks when the photo for signal was bright, uh, we actually observed the blobs moving away from the system. So that's a direct observation of jets, but um, yeah. Remember, I was the title of my talk was "You Could Do Something Exciting with a Floating Telescope," and you could maybe get some hints of if there is. So maybe the light that was seen uh, that I was seeing through my eyepiece the other night that was going up and down was coming from jets, and that's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I think I'll I'll stop there. And uh, you were asking about the yeah. So there is. Here is uh, diagram V four of those fields. This one. So it's only smaller than nineteen sixteen, and uh, and it's significant point and six point. Um. Yes, but also to be honest, I don't think Jerry has updated this in <laughs> a few decades. <laughs> but I'll, I'll stop there and, and take questions. Questions? Okay. <laughs> okay, so uh, just um, how many extra binaries are there in the galaxy? Like 31, 35? Oh, uh, no, in hundreds now. In hundreds now? Extra yeah, binaries are many. Yeah. Yeah. Black hole, black hole, like neutron. Neutron. Oh, About yeah. 100 neutron are binary and uh, 20 black holes are detected. This looks like a black hole. This is already a black hole. Black hole candidates. Black hole candidates. So, I mean, this is like. And this is also, don't take it as I said, this is quite a clear show. So, there are quite a few. Yeah. But the. What are the short ones again? So, I, I guess my question is like, uh, maybe it's a little cynical, but see, if you have 100 XRD systems in your galaxy, I'm thinking that by now we would know everything about them. Is that not the case? Or no, as you can see, even with this, we can't predict what is what is going on. I mean, forget statistical surveys, even on a source by source basis. So there are there are a, a number of extra galactic extra binary that has been detected, right? Yeah, absolutely. So what's the Some number? Like yeah. about ten, maybe or a few. Less than ten. Something. Yeah, I mean we're we are getting. With deep Chandra observations, so deep then the question is that yeah. when you look at these extra extra galactic extra rays and you compare them, you know, statistically with the galactic extra rays, you see like there is a universality in their properties. 
uh, university in terms of their spectral signatures, like when they are bright and in outburst, it seems like the spectrum is dominated by an occlusion disc, those things. But um, the problem with extragalactic X-ray binaries is that they are so faint that their coverage cannot be as extensive as these galactic ones. Most extragalactic X-ray binaries you still pick up only in, in, the, the, in, the in or in some dedicated observation tube where for some other purpose. So the observing cadence is, is a lot worse for them. So your like you know outburst recurrence time and duration and things like that. Uh, why do we expect them to be similar? There isn't as good a light curve for extra galactic extra binaries as there is for galactic simply because they're brighter and therefore easier to track. And there are ULXs, but those are different for different Yes. So you neglected the question about the Hubble Space Telescope. All right. You can take this from one these two, as it is right there. I mean two and then two. Where do we end up with this? So the R band doesn't do what this band these bands do in fact uh hmm, mac is going to die give me a second here let me see if i can plug the Jitana, can i get a power yeah, yeah. 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 but he doesn't need any oh i don't know that yeah i would yeah oh yeah yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is, we don't need anything else. Yeah, yeah. 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 Meanwhile, I can take other questions. Some, some horrifying thing also happened to me previous to that. Uh, I was like doing a class here, and when I just plugged in the adapter, the whole thing went off. Now it is now it is fine. Yes. Yeah. Ten, 10 to 15. Yeah. Yeah. That's so when this system was not active and the light was coming mostly from the donor star, you can you can observe the variation in the light from the coming from the donor star and you can model that. And you can do some spectroscopy to get the speeds. So you can combine them to get what is called the mass function, which is a constraint on the mass of the black hole.